On 375 BC, Plato publishes a book called The Republic. And The Republic depicts an event where Socrates is with a group of his peers and they decide to discuss what it means to be just or what justice is. And Socrates does what Socrates normally does and doesn't answer the question first and asks other people questions. And, but when it finally got to his turn, Socrates decides to answer the question of what it means to be just by answering it in the form of a just city. Because according to Socrates, a just city is made up of just people by definition. And this city is not what you would think it would be. It has a lot of weird practices such as eugenics and caste structures and the higher classes lying to the lower classes to keep the city in balance. So I'd like to talk about why Socrates' ideal city is, it's decent in theory, but when it comes down to its practices, it isn't logical at all. And I think we should first take a look at the foundations of Socrates' city, and then we'll look at why it's not ideal in practice. So when it comes time for Socrates to talk about his ideal city, Socrates first does what he does again and talks about what a just city would not be. And he does this by categorizing five different regimes or societies into a top five list. So his number five regime is tyranny. And so tyranny is ruled by fear and there's no just laws. So obviously this would be as far as possible from a just city. But surprisingly enough, the next regime, number four, is democracy. Socrates can't stand democracy and he thinks it is antithetical to a good society. So one of the issues Socrates points out in a democratic society is that the people who are running for office have to appeal to the masses and therefore act like a demagogue. And everything they do has to appeal to the masses and therefore it, they, instead of prioritizing justice, they are prioritizing appealing to the masses. And as you can see in any society, the general masses are not intelligent enough. I mean, most people are not intelligent enough to understand what is just and what is not just. So when you rely on the masses to determine a just society, you will fail. Socrates uses the story of a group of people on a ship and they're trying to figure out where to go. Uh, all of the sailors are arguing about where to go and who should take charge and the captain of the ship is looking up at the stars already trying to find out where to go. So the purpose of this story is that the person who is most fit for rule is usually the person who is not arguing and trying to show that they're the best person fit to rule. So number three on Socrates' list is an oligarchy. So the issue with oligarchies is that instead of prioritizing justice or reason, people prioritize wealth. And when you were prioritizing wealth, obviously you sacrifice justice at the cost of wealth, and that cannot be a just city. So because of that, Socrates puts it on number three on his list. And number two is a democracy, which is a bit better than oligarchy, but it has its same issues. The reason why it's better than oligarchy is because in a democracy, it is ruled by the honorable instead of rule of the wealthy. So obviously being honorable is a little bit better of a trait than being wealthy. And but still you are not prioritizing uh, reason or justice, you are prioritizing your honor. Because democracy and oligarchy practice honor and wealth respectively above justice, then the most just city must be a city that prioritizes justice above all. And that Aristotle believes to be aristocracy, meaning ruled by the best. This is not the uh, modern times aristocracy where you have a uh, Queen Elizabeth and all that crap. Instead, it is ruled by literally the best person or the person that is most fit to rule. And this Socrates believes is the philosopher king or a person who rules by wisdom and reason. Now that Socrates has described what the ideal form of government would be, he moves on to define more of the intricate details of this government and what would take place in its society. So one thing that Socrates is a firm believer of is a caste system, a three-part caste system. This is where Socrates describes the story of a charioteer. 
the story of the charioteer is the charioteer is being led by a white horse and a black horse. The white horse constantly wants to pull the charioteer up into the sky and the black horse constantly wants to pull the charioteer down into the ground. But is it up to the charioteer to use his reason and balance out the acts of both of the horses so that he continues straight on the path? And this resembles the three levels of the caste system that Socrates wants to implement. So at the bottom, you have the, the black horse or the artisans. And the artisans are ruled by their desires. And if you have a city full of people ruled by their desires, then, they would be, then the city would not work. And to go back to the analogy, the city would be constantly pulled down instead of going on the correct path. So the artisans are ruled by their desires and therefore destined to produce material goods because they are constantly focused on the material world and cannot go above and focused on, on wisdom and reason and things like that. And the second level is the auxiliaries and the auxiliaries are the military of this society. And the auxiliaries should use their spirit. They resemble the white horse and they, they, their spirit should resemble their courage for protecting the city. And to balance the auxiliaries out, so they are not just focused on killing and violence, Socrates suggests that they should be taught music, poetry, and literature. So the final cast is the guardians or the philosopher kings. And the philosopher kings would be the people that rule themselves over reason and wisdom. These would be the charioteers, to go back to the analogy. Guardians, unlike artisans, would not focus on material things, but instead focus on wisdom and reason and higher intellectual activities. The guardians would also be in that place because they would not have the desire for power or rule, which Socrates believes is an extremely important characteristic for a ruler to have, because if you desire to rule, then you desire your ego to inflate and you desire power, and that is not some of the characteristics or qualities that a ruler should have. Another interesting part about the guardians is that not all of the guardians who are born in the guardian class will continue to be guardians. Only the guardians that have shown their ability to rule will continue to be a guardian. The guardians who are not able to prove their worth are then sent down to auxiliaries, where their role is to fulfill the will of the guardians. So a question that may arise is how Socrates plans to keep the citizens in their caste and not want to move outside of their caste. Socrates suggests something called the myth of the metals. And the myth of the metals is a story that all people are born with a different type of metal inside their bodies. It is either gold, silver, or copper. And if you are born with gold inside your body, then you become a guardian. And if you are born with silver, then you become an auxiliary. And if you are born with copper, then you become an artisan. And children are usually born with the same gold as their parents. And Socrates says that there may be some exceptions. I don't, I don't know how he plans to determine those exceptions. He probably leaves it up to the philosopher kings. And the only exception that Socrates makes is that no child may go up a class into the guardian class. So a child can become uh, auxiliary from an artisan or a child can move down to a lower caste, but no child can ever move up into a guardian class. Because Socrates' society is so different when compared to other societies during his time, one might wonder how Socrates plans on getting that many people to join his society or allow him to create this society. So Socrates, plans to do this by conquering a neighboring town and only taking children 10 and 10 and under and start from there. So this way you can start a society from a fresh set of minds with no preconceived notions on how a government should be run. So yeah, you can see how that solution can come into problems of its own, of its own but we'll talk about that later. Another thing I found interesting was that Socrates' society is a mix of authoritarianism and communism. Authoritarianism in relation to the philosopher kings and the caste structures, and communist in relation to the fact that people should want to do good for their city out of no motivation other than the love for their city. And another communist aspect is that people are not allowed to have nuclear families. Everyone is born into their community 
and there should be no nuclear mother and father. It should just be the child is born and the child is raised by the community. There are also no private households for any caste. The people that are born are born into a dormitory and they live together with the rest of their caste, which is very, which goes along with the fact that they're not allowed to be born and have a mother and father. Another communist part of the society is that there should be no money and people should, again, just work out of the love for their city and do the best they can out of the love for their city. Another interesting part of Socrates' society is how he suggests that the society should practice eugenics. And to the way that Socrates plans on getting away with this is by suggesting another lie in that the philosopher king should lie to everyone else and say that their sexual partner is selected based on a lottery style. But in fact, the philosopher kings are just selecting people in a way that will produce the most desirable child. Another interesting part of Socrates' society that was a bit progressive for his time is that he believed that men and women were equal and that they should both have equal chances in their abilities to rule. Yes, Socrates did realize that there were some physical differences that men and women had, but in general, Socrates believed that they should be treated equally. So now that we have taken a look at Socrates' ideal society, let's now move on to its faults and how it would never really work in reality. So I think it is important to take a look back at history and Socrates' history to understand why Socrates has these somewhat radical ideas, even for his time. So Socrates fought in the Peloponnesian War, and when his state of Athens lost, he began to think of any way possible that he could make his state better. And one thing Socrates noticed was Athens' democratic form of government, which Athens actually took great pride in because they were, I think, the first democratic government ever. But Socrates completely disagreed with that, and so he tried to theorize the best form of government. So the issue is that the best form of government in theory may not be the best form of government in practice. And regardless of all of its flaws, Socrates' form of government has almost no chance of being practiced in reality at all. I think the main issue is that Socrates just expects way too many things to happen and way too many people to just blindly follow along with his ideas and accept everything he says. Um, even if you took a group of 10 year old kids or younger, let alone if you were even were able to do that, I doubt that you would get even 10 year old kids to believe this form of government. I mean, even kids f five years or younger will remember that you come into their town and slaughter their whole family and take them and use them as guinea pigs to start a new society. Um, but let's say that Socrates did get um, a group of young people together and he got them to believe that he didn't just slaughter all their parents. And they so all these 10 year olds and younger were all on board with Socrates to create this new society. So assuming that they say that, assuming that the children go along with this, Another hurdle that you would have to overcome is the myth of the metals. And if you have a large amount of people, let's say even a couple thousand people, it would be hard to get everyone to come on board with the myth of the metals and be happy with where they are at and not want anything more in their life. Another thing that you have to take into account for is Socrates' idea of eugenics, which isn't really a good system. I mean, we've seen how that's been practiced in royal families and if you take that and how it was practiced in royal families and then multiply it by a thousand, you're gonna see how a practice of eugenics like that is going to run into a lot of issues. I think another thing that is important to consider is that Socrates wishes to have all of his people educated and have them use reason and wisdom to the best of their abilities. And yet he also wants them to be foolish enough to believe the myth of the metals and to believe that eugenics is a proper way of reproduction and that they should never want more in life. I think if you take a look at society, the most intelligent people are the ones that always desire more in life and always want to do more. So let's say that Socrates was successful in destroying a city, getting all the 10 year olds and younger from that city, getting them to believe in his myth of the metals, his idea of eugenics and the idea of the caste system. So let's say that all of that is done. Even if Socrates was to get all those things to happen, you still have the issues or surrounding communism, 
with the f in regards to the fact that Socrates does not believe that anyone should own any property, they should have no private housing, and they should all live in great commune communes, and that mothers and fathers should no longer exist. And I think this goes completely against human nature, and this would be the greatest exception Socrates would have to make to a society. I think it would be incredibly hard to have a mother and father give birth to a child and then ask them to just completely give that child up for the sake of their society. I think that is an incredibly demanding thing to ask, especially when you've already asked people in, in the society to do all of the other things. In pursuit of creating his just city, Socrates has manipulated human nature to an extent that would blur the lines of what it means to be human. He's also failed to account for the mental capacity of people in the classes and how those people would act in reality. Even if Socrates were to convince his people to structure his society as he sees fit, one would have to question how valuable justice is when the very things that make us human are sacrificed.